Our topic that we now resume is Alliance with Rome. And Rome is the Christian, Orthodox, Byzantine Empire, which today is led by Russia. And they're the ones who are following Nabi Isa Islam. And Allah says that he's going to intervene to cause these Christians to become over powerful, dominant over the others for committing kufr. And when that takes place, then it will continue until Kiyama. And I want to suggest to you that that moment is about to occur when Allah will intervene to ensure that in the war which is now about to take place that this part of the Christian world which is faithful to Nabi Isa will overcome that part which is committing kufr and that this part will then remain dominant over that part until Kiyama. Surah Rahman confirms our conclusion. We have pointed out that in Surah Rahman, Allah has spoken about two people. And he repeats the ayah 31 times. So he's making 31 attempts to get us to think. Why did he not mention it only once? Why? 31 times. <laughs> and who are these two? Rub for be ayi ala i rabbi kuma, rabbi kuma, two, two people. Who are they that he's addressing? And who are rejecting the truth which has come from Allah? Rejecting the truth which has come from Allah to Kaziban. And he answers, Ya ma'ashar al jinni wal ims. It is an alliance of human beings who are sinful, rejecting the truth from Allah, and jinn, who are kuffar, who are shayateen. The signs <coughs> of these two. And he tells us how to recognize them. When he goes on to say, Ya ma'ashar al jinni wal ins, inistata'atum and tanfuzu min aqtari samawati wallah. If you wish to embark on the efforts to explore and to penetrate that which is above and that which is below, the ocean, the depths of the earth, then go ahead and make the effort. And we see who are the people who did it, who gave us the world, gave to the world all the Star Wars and the intercontinental ballistic missiles and the satellites and so on. And who then used their control of the air, the skies, to establish their military dominance over the world. It is these Christians there. And they were able to do it because they were in alliance with the shayateen. They won't teach you this at Oxford University. <laughs> but the truth doesn't come from Oxford. It comes from the Quran. And woe unto those who are neglectful of the Quran. Woe unto those who will not go to the Quran to seek to explain the reality which is right there in front of you today and which has been there with you for 500 years. But Allah goes on to say something more. He says, لَا تَنْفُذُونَ إِلَّا بِسُلْطَانِ 
Don't forget. Never forget for one moment that you'll only be able to get your missiles to fly and your revolving satellites and your military stations up there in the sky and your robotic submarines at the bottom of the ocean nuclear armed and stuff. This will only take place to the extent that authority is given. And authority comes from Allah, not from the Security Council of the United Nations. <laughs> and so, inherent in this declaration is that they should never have forgotten when they started NASA and they started your attempt to control the skies, military. Allah says, in the same way that Allah gave authority for you to do it, one day He can withhold that authority. On that day when He decides that this part of the Christian world is now going to become ascendant over that part of the Christian world, on that day He can withhold authority. I don't know if there are other scholars of Islam who are explaining Surah Rahman this way. I don't know. There may be. But I'm saying to you that the Quran is actually telling us that in the war which is now coming, the 500 years of Western dominance over mankind is coming to an end. And modern Western civilization is riding out into the sunset. And those who follow Nabi Isa alayhi salam, after this war which is coming, will now be dominant over their rivals. What remains to be done now is to show the implications of the conquest of Constantinople which will follow the Great War. And since Allah is intervening in the Great War, سَنَفْرُغُ لَكُمْ أَيُّهَا الثَّكَلَانِ Since Allah is intervening in the Great War to ensure that this side becomes dominant over that side, وَجَاعِلُ الَّذِينَ تَبَعُوكَ فَوْكَ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا And when this happens, it will be إِلَى يَوْمِ الْكِيَامَةِ This side will be dominant over that side until the end of the world. It follows that Allah must also be the one who chose that the conquest of Constantinople should follow the Great War. Here is Constantinople. Today they've changed the name to Istanbul and they prohibited the use of the name Constantinople. Why? Because they don't want you to remember what Nabi Muhammad alayhi salatu was the prophet said. That's why they did it. This is the Black Sea. And this is here, again, the Black Sea. And this is the Mediterranean Sea here. And this is the Bosphorus. If you, if you want to move from the Black Sea to the Mediterranean Sea, you have to pass through the Bosphorus. The Black Sea has Crimea, we can't see it on this map. Crimea controls the Black Sea. Here is Crimea, yeah, here is Crimea. If you control Crimea, you control the whole of the Black Sea. And that's what Russia just achieved two years ago. And when Russia took back Crimea, we said, it's time for us to celebrate. Go back and see the, my lectures on YouTube. I said, this is the time for us to celebrate because Russia has recovered Crimea, which means Russia now controls the Black Sea. But if you control the Black Sea, you still need to pass through there to come to the Mediterranean Sea. And the conquest of Constantinople here is meant to liberate the Bosphorus. 
so that the Russian Navy could pass through there. But I said there's another reason why Allah has chosen that the conquest of Constantinople must follow the Malhama, and that is because of Hagia Sophia. There we are. There's Hagia Sophia. Hagia Sophia. This is the Christian cathedral of the Orthodox Christian people. This is their major, more foremost cathedral in the world. And this has been the most important cathedral for them for 1,000 years. So it was not by accident, not at all, but by satanic design that the Sultan Muhammad Fatih, when he conquered Constantinople, the first thing that he did was to take this cathedral and convert it into a masjid. It was by satanic design. It was meant to sabotage the end time friendship and alliance between the Ummah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and the Ummah of Nabi Isa alayhi salam. That's why Sultan Muhammad Fatih disgracefully and shamefully and manifestly sinfully took this cathedral and converted it into a masjid to the eternal shame and disgrace of the world of Islam. And so now we know that the reason why the conquest of Constantinople takes place after the Malhama is so that when we conquer Constantinople, we can then return this cathedral to the Orthodox Christian world. And the dagger which has been planted into their hearts will be withdrawn and the blood will stop flowing and the alliance with Rome will then be cemented. But there are those who say, how can you have an alliance with the people? How can you call them Christian when they worship Jesus as God and they declare that he is the son of God? And this is shirk. And the Quran declares that Allah is prepared to forgive all sins but not shirk. What answer do we have to give? The answer is do not take any verse of the Quran in isolation because you could be ending up misguided. You will end up declaring that Iblis was an angel. <laughs> which is what they believe and that he committed this big sin and then he became a fallen angel that's what they believe but we don't we don't believe that angels fall down <laughs> so be careful do not take any verse of the Quran in isolation otherwise you can make the mistake of ending up believing that Iblis was an angel Proper methodology is to go to all the verses of the Quran, not to one. Here is one verse which says that Allah will not forgive sick. But look at the other one now. Surah Al-Ma'idah. And Allah speaks to Nabi Isa alayhi salam and asks him, Did you say to the people, to worship me and my mother as gods beside Allah, did you do that? And he said, no, I never did that. I never taught them anything other than what you taught me. Well, then he ends by saying, if you punish them for this belief that I am God and the Son of God, if you punish them, then they are your servants and you have the right to punish them. But if you forgive them, you doubt me that this is in the Quran? You doubt that? That? Yes, this is in the Quran. Go check it out. But if you forgive them, then you are the forgiving, the merciful, including therefore the possibility 
that the entire Christian world which worships Jesus as God and as the Son of God can be forgiven by Allah if he chooses to. So it's not for us to pass judgment. It's for Allah to pass judgment. And so don't say, well how can we call them Ahlul Kitab when they're eating pork? How can we call them Ahlul Kitab when they say that a man can marry another man and get a marriage certificate? How can we call them Ahlul Kitab when they're lending money on interest? How can we do this? How can we do this? How can we? And the end, endless, endless, endless objections. The answer is, if a man says, when the angel questions him, which is your prophet? And he says, Muhammad, alayhi salatu wasalam. And the man is drinking alcohol, as many Muslims are drinking today. He may be eating bacon and eggs for breakfast <laughs> and drinking wine for lunch. It's not for you to say he's not a Muslim. Only Allah can say that. Allah has said in the Quran, وَمَا يَتَوَلَّهُ مِنْكُمْ فَإِنَّهُ مِنْهُمْ Whosoever from amongst you turn to them, meaning the alliance of Jews and Christians, which is today the Zionist alliance. If you turn to them with friendship and alliance, فَإِنَّهُ مِنْهُمْ You no longer belong to us, you belong to them. Only Allah is authorized to say that. That this man is no longer a Muslim. If we come to that fatwa, it has to be based on the Quran. So you cannot say they are not Ahlul Kitab anymore, unless Allah says so. <coughs> so be careful, be careful when you speak like this. So it is possible that Allah can forgive them. But we know that once Nabi Isa Islam comes back, then something is going to happen to the entire world of Christians and Jews who are Ahlul Kitab. What does the Quran say? It says in Surah Al-Nisa, وَإِن مِّنْ أَهْلِ الْكِتَابِ إِلَّا لَيُؤْمِنَنَّ بِهِ قَبْلَ مَوْتِهِ وَيَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ يَكُونُ عَلَيْهِمْ شَهِيدًا that when Nabi Isa alayhi salam returns, then every single wrong belief that they had, every single thing that they rejected that was the truth, they would have to accept it. But for some of them, it will be too late. وَيَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ يَكُونُ عَلَيْهِمْ شَهِيدًا The door for mercy and for Tawbah is now closed for you. But for others, for others, they now recognize Nabi, Nabi Muhammad as a prophet, yes. And they now recognize the Quran as the word of Allah, yes. They do not enter into the Ummah because that's an obligatory, because they have their Nabi, and they have their Sharia, and they have their Qibla and their Qibla is still valid, that's what the Qur'an says. The Qur'an says their Qibla is still valid, the Qur'an says their Qibla is still valid for them. Go and check it out. Go and check it out. So where this nonsense has come from? That everybody will have to join the Ummah of Muhammad Islam, including Nabi Isa Islam. I'm sorry for you on judgment day. I'm sorry for you on Judgment Day if you open your mouth to utter such nonsense because Allah never sent him to this Ummah. If you don't study the Quran then you speak nonsense. Allah sent him to Banu Israel, not to this Ummah. And you want him to take Shahada and become a member of this Ummah. I mean this is a PhD in stupidity. And so now we 
Okay then, to cement the alliance with just one more verse of the Quran. And I love this one. It shows the extremely close bond of love between that Nabi and this Nabi. In consequence of which, the alliance between this Ummah and this Ummah is inevitable. Shall we continue? Nabi Isha Islam addresses Banu Israel and informs them that he is the messenger of Allah unto them. And he has come to confirm the truth which was there before in the Torah. Saddikan lima bayna yadayka min Torah. But then he goes on to say something else. Wa mubashiran bi rasulin yati min ba'di smuhu ahmad. Did you hear that? I have come to give you the good news of a messenger. Rasul is a messenger. A Nabi who is sent to a people becomes a messenger. A Rasul. And his name will be Ahmad. Oh, but wait a minute. Did he not study the Quran? Yes, Allah taught him the Quran. Because Allah says so in the Quran. When the angel came to Maryam, السلام, the angel informed her that this baby boy who is going to be born will be Al-Masih, the Messiah. And that Allah is going to teach him. الكتاب, and if you do only five rupees worth of it research, you know kitab here is the Quran. Not much. Part of the Quran. Will you allimu hul kitab? Wal hikmah? Wal tawrat? Wal injil? And Allah is going to teach him the Quran. The kitab here is the Quran. And Allah is going to teach him the Torah and the Injil. But in between the, the Quran on this side and the Torah and the Injil on that side, why does Allah put the word Hikmah? Huh? You know when he comes down. Imam al-Mahdi would recognize him. This is the son of Mary. And then our Imam or our Khalifa, our Amir al-Mu'min in that time will do the right thing. Oh yes, he'll do the right thing. He will invite him to lead the Salah. This is Nabi Allah. <laughs> I am only Imam. He is Nabi. So he does the right thing to invite him to lead the Salat. If Allah did not teach him the Quran and the Injil and the Zabur and the Torah and the Sharia on this side and the Sharia on that side, he could make a mistake and then all fall down. So he has to have hikmah to handle the situation. A Sharia on this side, a Sharia on that side. And there is the Hikmah. Because he knows that if he accepts the invitation and he leaves the Salah, he will be in conflict with Allah's guidance. He must know that. That once you leave the Salat and the Imam prays behind you, you now become Amir al Mu'minin of this Ummah. But Allah, they haven't sent 
did not send him to this ummah. So he cannot lead the salah. Here is the hikmah. And that's why he says, the people have appointed you to lead the salah. You lead the salah. But when he performs the salat behind Imam al-Mahdi, he must know how to perform salat. Otherwise, you might make a mistake. The first time he's making, performing salat this way, because their salat is different, and their salat is different, and our salat is different, different sharia. So Allah teaches him the sharia here and the sharia there. And because he has to stand between these two, you better have a lot of wisdom. So he says to Banu Israel, I've come to give you the good news of a Rasul, meaning a Nabi who is sent to a people that is a Rasul or someone who is sent by Allah to a people that's a Rasul. Someone could be a, an angel, sent an angel, become a Rasul. And his name would be Ahmad. But he knows the name is Muhammad because he studied the Quran. Allah taught him the Quran. And Allah has mentioned four times in the Quran the name is Muhammad. Muhammadur Rasulullah. Walladina na'ahu ashidda'u ala al-kuffar ila akhid al-ayah. Wa ma Muhammad illa Rasul. Four times in the Quran, four times, the name is mentioned as Muhammad. So why did he say Ahmad? <laughs> the Quran has come down. If all the explanations of the Quran are already given, do we have any need to think? Is there any need to think? If every explanation is already given? So why should he say, the Quran has been sent down because there is still more in the Qur'an for you to extract. If you think, but now we have stopped thinking. The Darul Ulum stopped thinking long ago. I'm not using these words to make people feel bad. No, that's not my style. I'm using these words because this is the truth. Iqbal, Iqbal said, we stopped thinking 500 years ago. That's what Iqbal said. We stopped thinking 500 years ago. My answer is that Allah is sending a powerful message with this one word. وَمُبَشِّرًا بِرَسُولٍ يَأْتٍ مِنْ بَعْدِ اسْمُهُ أَحْمَدٍ Allah is saying to us, if we have the capacity to think, the Nabi Isa alayhi salam is choosing a secret name, a special name for only him and him between them. That when there's intense love between two people, you never address them by their name. That's love. No matter if you reach a hundred years of age, you're an old man with a walking stick. And she's an old woman with a walking stick. And you have a secret name for her. You will use that name until the end of the world. That's love. A special name, a secret name. And so when the Isa al-Islam returns to his world, every time he refers to our Nabi, he will say Ahmad. 
Why? Allah is saying, this is the bond of intense love that exists between this Nabi and that Nabi. And Nabi Muhammad confirmed it. And he said, more than that. He said that when he comes back, he will die. And he'll be buried next to me. And so now, let's think. If this Nabi, who is leading this Ummah, and this Nabi, who is leading this Ummah, have intense love and affection for each other, what should the relationship be between this Ummah and this Ummah? I rest my case. I rest my case. I rest my case. That the natural alliance for the Ummah of Muhammad is an alliance with the Ummah of Nabi Isa Islam. And it must be with those who are following him. And we know who are those who are following him. Because they don't, they don't declare that a man can marry another man and get a marriage certificate. We pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala might open our hearts to the Qur'an. That we might do our homework with the Qur'an. And search in the Qur'an for that which explains the reality of the world today. And when we find it, to proclaim it, regardless of the price we have to pay. Rabbana taqabbal minna inna kanja samir alim. Wa tub alayna ya mulana inna kanja tawab rahim. Wa rahmatika ya ahma rahim. Amin. an answer session. Inshallah, I think there's a, a brother and a sister who will be coordinating the questions from the sisters. So can the, if the sisters do have any questions, if you could please uh, write them down and pass them on to the nominated sister. And inshallah, we'll uh, get those questions raised with the Sheikh. Uh, over to yourselves now. Uh, in, in regards to the subject that the Sheikh's been talking on, uh, do we have any questions from the floor? Any questions? What is the current situation in Turkey? What, what's there? What's there now? Turkey? Turkey? What happened to Turkey? It's the name of our country, yes? Yeah. This question is, what's, what's the current situation with Turkey and what's their role within the Muhammad? What is our current situation with Turkey and what is their role in the Muhammad? You cannot understand Turkey today without understanding the Ottoman Empire for 600 years. The Ottoman Empire was created by Dajjal, like Saudi Arabia was created by Dajjal. Like Pakistan had been ruled and controlled by Dajjal from day one. From day one. And every time Pakistan has attempted to get out of the crutches, they've killed the leader. Uh, so the Ottoman Empire has been <coughs> created by the Dajjal, but the Dajjal is not a fool. No, no, no. So the Ottoman Empire made, did many good things. Oh yes. 
But the Ottoman Empire waged endless wars, unjust wars, unjust bogus jihad on the Orthodox Christian world for 600 years. And the reason why they did that was to sabotage the end time alliance and friendship between this Ummah and this Ummah. The reason why the Ottoman Empire took Hagia Sophia and converted it into a masjid was to ensure that this alliance never comes into being between this Ummah and this Ummah. The reason why the Ottoman Empire took the name Constantinople and threw it away and replaced it with Istanbul and prohibited the use of the name Constantinople in Turkey is because they want to sabotage the end time friendship and alliance between this Ummah and this Ummah. But the Turkish people have been so brainwashed and brainwashed and brainwashed the intensity of the brainwash is so great that they hate me now probably more than they hate anybody else on the face of the earth. That's my status today in Turkey and in the Balkans. But I don't care two peanuts at all. If what I am speaking is the truth, if I am explaining the Quran correctly, I am on the right side of history and you on the wrong side of history. So I have to continue my work and pray to Allah for protection. That's right. What is Turkey's role today and in the Hanmalham? Turkey is a member of NATO. Regardless of whatever statements they are making that are opposed to NATO, the fact is that they are legally legally by treaty a member of NATO and they have a lawful legal obligation if war takes place and the Western Alliance attacks Russia then Turkey has a legal obligation to fight against Russia the Russians know that the Turkish people know that how will Turkey behave? how will Turkey behave? <laughs> if the war breaks out. My answer is I do not trust the Turkish ruler today. And my answer is I don't think Russia trusts him as well. I don't have anything more to say. Yeah. Uh, if, if, the, if, if the Ottoman Empire uh, is, uh, is created by the job, then uh, you know the contributions that the Ottoman Empire has made to Islam uh, in terms of literature and the restoration of the Prophet's mosque, uh, are they also from the job? Oh, I just answered that question. Perhaps you were not here. I just answered that question. I said the Jal is not a fool. <laughs> the Jal is not a fool. Okay? The Jal will do many good things in order to slip the evil in. Saudi Arabia today is a country universally, rec universally recognized in the world of Islam. as garbage. Those who rule over Saudi Arabia. The garbage. The Ummah. As people who have betrayed us. Betrayed the Ummah. And yet, you will find in Saudi Arabia aspects of Islam you will not find anywhere else in the world. Okay? Because Dajjal is not a fool. Any more? Trumpa said, uh, Trumpa said that he's, uh, the Soviet, the, 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 he's, he recognizes... Someone will have to tell me what's the question and I, I can't hear. What's the, what's the question, so, brother? The question is, Trumpa said that uh, Jerusalem is the capital of Israel as the last period of, of the build up to the Madama started with this pronunciation of this. What uh, Trump has done and of course you know he's a schoolboy, is to extend legal recognition, diplomatic recognition of Jerusalem as the capital of Israel, of U.S. recognition. But in doing so, he's done us a favor. <laughs> because Jerusalem is the most important city in the world for every Jew. 
And Jerusalem is the most important city in the world for every Christian. And insofar as Islamic eschatology is concerned, the end time, Jerusalem stands at the heart of Akhiru Zaman for a Muslim. Mumran awaited not this. And so there are three claims to Jerusalem, the world of Islam, the world of Christianity, the world of Judaism. Masjid al-Aqsa is in the Quran, not just in the hearts of Muslims, it's in the Quran. And so if the schoolboy in Washington had some common sense, as many in the American diplomatic service would agree. Then the US, U.S. government, instead of extending diplomatic recollection to only the Jews for Jerusalem, you control Jerusalem, Israel, would rather have recognized the rights of all three religions and would have said that we have to work out a formula where all three faiths can share Jerusalem on the basis of <coughs> political equality and mutual respect. If he had used these words, if he had used these words that I just used, then we have to find a formula where all three faiths can share Jerusalem on the basis of political equality and mutual respect, Trump's name would have gone down in history in gold. What he has done, however, is to take Christianity and throw it out into the cold. Not that Christianity which is in alliance with Judaism, the other Christianity, which is not, where a man cannot marry another man and get a marriage to him. And the world of Islam and taking them and throw them out into the cold. So in the process of giving Jerusalem to only the Jews, he has now ensured the alliance of Islam with this Christianity. Any more questions? I have a question from one of the sisters. Uh, the sister asks, Anbiya slash Rasul are buried at the place of their passing. The Hadith states, Isa alayhi salam will be buried in Medina. How do we re reconcile between the two? I would be grateful if you can kindly provide me from the Book of Allah the evidence that Anbiya are buried at the place where they die. I don't know that this is in the Quran. Okay? And I don't know where he will die. Do you know where he will die? Does anyone know where he is dying? The Quran does not tell us where he will die. The Hadith does not tell us where he will die, but we are told that he will be buried in Medina. And for me that's enough, I don't have any more questions to ask. It, the uh, the Turkey, Turkey makes a way for the NATO. Is there a chance that Turkey falling into the alliance of the Rome, which appears to be? If Turkey breaks its connection with NATO, revokes its membership in NATO. Is it possible that Turkey can then enter into an alliance with Rome? That's the question. My answer is I would be the most surprised man on the face of the earth if Turkey ends an alliance uh, membership in NATO. Because I suspect that NATO is using Turkey as their Trojan horse. If you don't know what's that, check it out. The Trojan horse. 